So it's a really, it's a lovely analogy, a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. And it sounds nice, but it's got incredible meaning. It's, it's a way of framing all of Buddha's teachings from A to Z. Or do you say Z in this country? You're American or English? Z or Z? Both. Or you say both? both? Depending on where you come from, okay. Well, I say Z in Australia. So from A to Z, it's A to Z. It's, all, it's a way of framing all the teachings in a nice orderly way, you know? So, yeah. So compassion, the body, whole Bodhisattva path, the Mahayana component, that's the point. Everything is really leading to that. The point of all of it is to finally become this Buddha, okay? Sangye in Tibetan, and it's really... The, the etymology of that word is so tasty. It tells us exactly the point in this entire path, you know, where you're heading, where you, when you graduate on this path. You graduate as a Buddha. You graduate as a Sangye. So Sang implies the total eradication from our mind of all nonsense, all ego, all fears, all depression, all anxiety, all anger, all jealousy, all attachment. Because the remarkable thing about the Buddha, this extraordinary being who existed in India two and a half thousand years ago, <coughs> this person who came out of this extraordinary Indian tradition before him, these great thinkers and philosophers, whose topic was the nature of self, Buddha found from his own experience, this is where this information is coming from, it's not revelation, he's not a creator, he doesn't assert a creator, he didn't make it up, hopefully, he's not speculating, this is his direct experience. He has found that these neuroses, these, mis these nonsense, which we all are so familiar with, are not at the core of our being. They are not there, they're not a natural part of us. They're natural insofar as we've all got them, but he's found from his own experience, which is what he achieved, that we can rid the mind of them totally. That's kind of astonishing, actually. If we hear it simply, if we hear it simply, that's quite a shocking concept. Psychologically speaking, there's nothing remotely like that in modern psychology. In fact, it sounds like insanity. Because we consider anger, fear, depression, jealousy as so normal that we factor them into ordinary psychology as normal parts of a normal human being. So much so that we would think you'd be abnormal if you didn't have them. So to hear what Buddha's saying is quite shocking, you know. And that's what he's saying. This is the point of being a Buddhist. Everything you study, think about, meditate on, anything you do, think, say, practice, all of it should be advice and methods that lead you to this. Now that's the accomplishment of the wisdom wing. Speaking roughly. Not only that, but sangye. Gye implies the development to perfection of all the other stuff inside us. <coughs> Compassion, love, empathy, intelligence, you name it, we all know that too. That, Buddha says, is at the core of our being, indestructibly so. This can't ever be removed. This is kind of, this, it sounds so strange to us. First of all, because we think the mind is the brain. Well, that's fine. Modern psychology talks about that. Well, this is a different model, okay? So then, for us, this is just weird talk. That's why we think it's mystical. That's why we think it's religious. But hear it really simply, really down to earth, really simple psychology. Buddha is a psychologist and I am not being sarcastic. The mind is his expertise. Everything in Buddhism comes down to the way the mind is and everything is for the purpose of changing this mind of ours, ridding it of all the rubbish and growing all the goodness. That's Sangye, that's Buddha, that's the goal, that's the result. That's the point of all of this. So, so even to hear this clearly is quite shocking because our assumptions are so deep about all this stuff. Having neuroscience, having all the, the modern psychologies, all the views, you know. This is not something that's positive. It's like a mad idea. That's why we think it's religious. That's why I put it in the sky and mystify it, you know. So hear it really simply. This is what Buddha, this person who lived two and a half thousand years ago, this is what he has found directly, experientially in his own mind. This is, and he presents his methodology. That's it. And all he's saying is, over to you guys. If you're interested in this, here are my findings. You start practicing it yourself. That's the approach in Buddhism, because he's not a creator. Therefore, he's not asking him to, ask, to believe what he's saying. That's a meaningless concept. It's part of the process. You have to have trust in somebody. If you've never studied acupuncture, you'd better trust your acupuncturist. But you don't just do that because they're cute. 
You do that because you've checked up on their, on their reputation, you've checked up on their knowledge, and so you've got confidence. Confidence, confide, with trust, with faith. But it's not just faith, which is how we tend to think of religion, you know. Not the Buddhist approach at all. It's just superficial. You won't get far with that. That's like believing in mathematics. Oh, I believe in mathematics. Well, I'm very happy for you. It works. But what good is believing in it? Your mother tells you to go buy three oranges and you don't know how to count. Well, you're useless, aren't you? That's why belief is, we, we think of religion as belief. And why is because God is superior, and I'm not being rude, and God made the universe, God is the boss, God, God, God runs the show. So it's, he's got a plan. That's completely fine. If you're a good Jew, good, good Muslim, good Catholic, go for it, please. Have faith in God. I am not criticising. That's just not Buddha's view, that's all. Completely different, fundamentally, in many ways. They've got many similar conclusions, but the fundamental point is this one. This is crucially different. So the Buddha is said, he was a regular guy who came to observe all the things that he says. So then if he can do it, we can do it. It's kind of logical, logical deduction, you know, logical. And that includes all the things that he talks about. The Buddhist worldview includes consciousness not being physical. We'll go into this. Past lives, future lives. We assume that's religion so it can't be known. No, of course not. Of course it can be. Buddha has found it to be true from his own experience. Not from putting a microscope on a brain, which is what we think, but putting a microscope internally on his own cognitive process, his own mind itself. This is where Buddhism comes from. The experiences of a person called Buddha and everybody else who's done the job since. You know, this is the approach. So the way then to take all this, if you decide to be a Buddhist, like say in my case, then why, the way I say it, and I mean it very sincerely, I never use the word, I never say I believe in karma, I never say I believe in reincarnation, I never say I believe in emptiness or believe in bodhicitta. It's ridiculous. I say I take this model as my working hypothesis and that is the correct, the, the correct approach to it, to any body of knowledge that you want to learn. We understand that in the ordinary world, we don't get it confused. But the second we say the word spiritual or religious, we lose all our common sense, you know. It's so ridiculous. And it's very deep in us to do that. So Sangye, Buddha, the two wings of the bird. The point of all of it is the, the, the compassion wing. But as the Dalai Lama says, compassion is not enough. You've got to have wisdom. So let's look at what that means, you know, because it's, it's a nice word. And it sounds a bit holy, but it's not meant to be. This gets us to the point in Buddhism, the mind. We have to understand. If we're interested in Buddhism, we have to know what he means by the mind. We can think what we like, it's okay. And you can indeed, you can take some Buddha's tools and never think about what he means by mind. You can still think your mind is the brain. I don't care. Think your mind's in your toenail, I don't care. You can still use Buddha's tools, some of them. But the big picture point of view, you know, you can't. The big picture point of view, you've got to take on board his viewpoints as your hypothesis. Otherwise it will all not make sense to you. It's all kind of nonsense, you know. And that's the scientific approach. You take something as your working hypothesis. And as the Dalai Lama says, if you, you choose to follow that methodology, step by step, ticking the boxes as you go, experiencing what he says as you go, and as you keep progressing, if you get to a point in your own experience where you find that what he says is wrong, then you must reject him. He's wrong. Perfectly fine. And you can't just think he's wrong. You have to prove it from your own experience. That's the real way you engage in it. But that's the way you engage in any body of knowledge, isn't it? It's the same. So what is the mind from the Buddha? You might as well use a different word because it's so fundamentally different in so many ways, you know. Well, first of all, for the Buddha, absolutely starting point. Your consciousness or your mind, these words are synonymous, broadly speaking, is not physical. It is not the brain. It is not even a function of the brain. When I was working on Lama Zopa's book about death and I read a book by an American medical journalist called The Undead. It's not about zombies, it's about all the, the contradictions and problems that are happening in the United States now. That was his expertise, that area, about because of farming organs, cutting out organs at the time of death. Big contradictions and conflicts now people are finding in the medical profession about exactly what is life and what is death, which is fantastic. I'm glad they're questioning their assumptions. But one doctor, 
because you know people there's always been all never mind but we'll, we'll discuss more but one of the things one doctor said i can say now with certainty that mind that consciousness is not a function of the brain i don't know what it is but that much i can say so that's good that's excellent buddha, buddha, this is buddha's point so okay your consciousness is not itself the brain the brain plays a role this is completely obvious and the way i'd put this is the brain is like the physical indicator of some things that are going on in your mind. That's the way to put that. Of course, if you're a neuroscientist, you'd be completely shocked at my absurd statement. So all I can do is tell you what Buddha said, okay? Buddha, you know, he came along first. He has some precedence. <laughs> okay, so your consciousness is not physical. Not, a, not the brain, not even a function of your brain. Affected by the brain, affected by the entire nervous system, affected by the body, that's obvious. Things are highly interdependent. Second, this is clear, your consciousness goes to far, has far more subtle levels of cognition. The job of mind is to cognize, to know, to be aware. That's its function. It has far more subtle levels of cognition than we in our modern world that only posit the brain absolutely do not posit as even existing, which again is why we think it's mystical, you know? Far more subtle levels of consciousness. And this amazing technique that these Indians before the Buddha created, as the Dalai Lama said, it was these amazing Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who first began the investigation into the nature of self. It wasn't Mr. Freud 150 years ago, it was three, more than 3,000 years ago, these amazing dudes, and Buddha got, came out of that culture they created this technique called single-pointed concentration, shamatha. This amazing, sophisticated, psychological skill that enables you to completely subdue the grosser level of consciousness, all the chaos of all the crazy thoughts, and the sensory. So, of course, as I'm saying, we don't posit anything beyond that because we stuck, we're stuck with the view it's the brain, you know. So, there are the, so with this technique, you can go beyond that grosser level, you can completely subdue the grosser level to access these subtler levels of our own mind. And this is the, that's what their expertise was. Buddha came along, used that technique, and got involved in all the philosophy, and then he diverged in his own direction, specifically in relation to his own findings about the nature of self. <coughs> so this technique is one of the central techniques still in Buddhism. He took it from these Hindus. I mean, they're happy to share, they don't mind. So the mind has got far more subtle levels, far more subtle. And this is unbelievably necessary. If you want to take on board the big Buddhist view, you've got to take this on board as a hypothesis. These techniques enable you to do that. The techniques are there. If you're really qualified, you can get it in a couple of years. You'll find out for yourself. And therefore, you'll have, the, you'll, will have access to this subtle level of mind that has far more powerful capacity for cognition. It's, it can cognize things that the grosser level can't, such as beyond the sensory, such as the past, the future, the minds of others. This is mystical to us. This is completely fitting in this model. And it's the experience of countless millions of beings over the centuries. And it's all there. The techniques are all there, laid out for anybody who wants to practice. So your mind goes to more subtle levels that don't depend upon the brain. If you were to see a person who'd accomplished single-pointed concentration, they would look like they were dead. Your consciousness is not physical. Your consciousness goes to more subtle levels. And this is the shocking one. If you're a materialist, this flies in the face of your view. And if you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, this flies in the face of your view. Buddha says your consciousness does, you are not the handiwork, your consciousness, your mind. Sorry, before we say that, the next thing about the mind is that word and consciousness are used to refer to the thoughts, intellect. Feelings, emotions, unconscious, subconscious, instinct, intuition, this entire spectrum of your inner being, all of that is equally mind or consciousness. Buddha doesn't have a term like spirit or soul. What we might use that to refer to, that is encompassed by what Buddha calls mind or consciousness. So the next point is, we are, that consciousness, that mind, which includes anger, love, compassion, psychosis, jealousy, lust, love, bliss, joy, compassion, you name it, being good at football, being good at music, all these tendencies, these characteristics of one's own personality, they are one's mind. And the point that Buddha's making is they're not the handiwork of your mummy and daddy, and they are not the handiwork of a creator. 
That for Buddha is the weirdest idea. This is my saying. Buddha's very polite. He doesn't say that. But the thought that someone can give you anger, give you psychosis, that someone can, that poor Hitler's Austrian housewife mummy can actually be the cause of that wacko, excuse me, that's really bizarre in Buddha's terms. Do you get my point? Ordinary people, it looks like we're a bit like mummy and daddy, so it seems to fit that they made us. They gave us anger, they gave us love, they gave us being good at music. But the Hitlers and the Mother Teresas, the extreme examples on the spectrum of good and bad, that's where it doesn't fit. Are you getting my point here? I mean, you know, you look on YouTube, you find, I mean, music, for example. You know, lately I saw one little three-year-old Chinese girl playing Bach. Excuse me, you didn't think it was possible. This little person, this little finger is playing Bach. Excuse me, you look at her mummy, she doesn't know how to play Bach. There's no genes in there that show that you just got to go, oh, wow, no one knows, she's an old soul. We just go shrug our shoulders, you know? Do you understand? So even little things like that. So the Buddha's view is very clear. The consciousness did not begin in your mother's womb. Th that assumption, we'll go into this, that assumption is the source of so much of our pain in this life. And I'll explain it when we talk about karma. We, in other words, Buddha's saying our consciousness does not begin in our mother's womb. It goes back and back and back and back. And we bring our own stuff with us into mummy's womb at the time of conception. So, the, so, the, so Buddha's point is so clear. Our mind, our love, our compassion, our goodness, our badness, our being good at music, whatever. They do not come from someone else. They can be triggered by other people behaving in a certain way towards us, but they've got to be in us in the first place to be triggered. This is a fundamental point. But this is so hard to hear because we're so used to the materialist view. And I'm not being sarcastic or cynical. I'm just trying to give a different model, that's all. We've got to try and see how it fits with everything because it's not, it's not necessarily comfortable. We're so familiar with the idea that our mummy and daddy not just made us, but are the cause of me. So therefore they're blame, aren't they? They're the blame, aren't they? That's why I go to my therapist. I talk about my wretched boyfriend, Shooky, harming me and cheating on me. And then she will naturally look back in the past for the events that happened, won't she? And that's what we all do. We're looking for the needle in the haystack, back in the past. What happened to Rabina? That, she be, that began this ridiculous thing of crummy boyfriends, you know? Or what, what happened that made her angry? What happened that made her jealous? That's how we talk. That's what we feel. Well, what mummy and daddy did definitely play a role. Your genes definitely play a role. But all Buddha's saying is they're not the main thing. And this takes time to hear, you know? It doesn't contradict the materialist view. We've just got to try and find a way to put it together. That's why these amazing conversations this last 30 years that Mind and Life organization in America, mindandlife.org, they've been organizing with the Dalai Lama and the best brains in the West. There's been incredible findings now with, these, with people listening to the, the Buddhist view, which no one thought of before until they started talking to the Dalai Lama, realizing how incredible their philosophy and psychology is actually. It's very fascinating. It's all been published, so it's wonderful. These, many of the findings about neuroplasticity are coming from these discussions, you know, so it's marvellous. So the Buddha's view is your consciousness is your own. The contents are there because, you, honey, you put them there. One way of saying it really simply is whatever's in our mind is a bunch of tendencies, is a bunch of habits. So you've got a tendency to play music. You, you are good at music. Why are you good at playing piano, Shuki? Well, duh, Rabina, I have been practising for 10 years. What's special, you know? It's a habit. Well, so is anger and so is love. But we don't think of it like that. Why are you good at music, Shuki? Well, I have practised for 10 years. He's honoured to own responsibility for his music, isn't he? Why are you good at arrogance and pride, ang uh, uh, let's say, anger, Shuki? Oh, that's not my fault. That's mummy's fault and daddy's fault and my wife's fault. <laughs> What's my genes fault? My DNA's fault? Everything but, yeah, I own it, it's my anger, Blur, you know, no way. We've got a very different view when it comes to emotional stuff. It's always someone else did it to me, you know. But being good at music, we're honoured to own it. And we're even humble enough to own that you're not very good at it because you didn't practice well. You don't say, well, it's, it's Einstein. No, you don't say, oh, it's Bach's fault, his music is bad. You'd never dare. You don't say, oh, that, you know, that, I, that Steinway piano is, in, is bad quality. You don't say, oh, my teacher was lousy. No, you take responsibility. That Buddha says you're being good at music or tendency to play football is equal to your tendency to be loving or compassionate or to want to kill. Of course, that's not comfortable for us because we have this very moralistic view about that stuff. You know? 
They're just tendencies in our own mind. And where they come from, it's a simple concept from having done them before. That's not complicated, actually. It's quite simple, but it's a shock to hear it. That's how come the three-year-old can play music. She came programmed with that tendency. How come Mr. Hitler did what he did? He came programmed with those wacky tendencies. It's not a difficult concept, but it's just not what we're used to thinking, that's all, you know. And then we think, oh, you mean I've got to believe in karma? No, don't believe in anything. Prove it to your first self first. First, conceptually, see it as coherent, you know. It's, just, it's a philosophy. It's a view. You can look into it. It's, we need to, know, need to know the theory first. We're all grown-ups. We're big, you know, we're big girls and boys. So, your mind is not physical. Your consciousness and mind are synonymously used, broadly speaking. It goes to far more subtle levels of cognition. It is not the handiwork of mummy, daddy or a creator. And finally, Buddha's point, the stuff in it that is miserable and neurotic and unhappy and fearful and dramas, which we all know, is not at the core of our being. These words are simple, so hear them clearly. And this is a shock, because everything in our being believes they are, that they're normal, and that you'd be abnormal if you didn't have them. So to hear this is, is quite a shock, but hear it. Take it as your hypothesis. And then secondly, the good stuff, love, compassion, blah, blah, they are fundamentally who we are. That's, they are who we really are for the Buddha. There's other stuff just like pollution in the way. That's his approach. You know? So as, as a concept, it's kind of encouraging because we feel that I'm hopeless, I'm no good, anger is in my bones, jealousy is in my bones, depression is who I really am. That's why we kill ourselves or others because we believe it's concrete and permanent. You know. So his view is quite profound, even hearing it, it should be encouraging to us. So why is it hard to hear it and why is it hard to take it on board and be excited about it? Well, there are various things that are obstacles in the way to doing that. Well, one, I think the main one, is the view we have, which is ego's view, which is samsaric philosophy, which is the view we all hold in the world and it's reinforced, let's say, in our materialist philosophical views it's a fact, that we are the handiwork of mummy and daddy, that the causes are out there, they did make me, the, g the genes, the DNA, the past behaviour, and then we go back mummy, daddy, grandma, grandpa to the monkeys, they are the causes of who I am. This is a fundamental point. So in many ways we can see that's true, we can prove it, we can say it's correct, but when it comes to you know, like, like lately, like in the States, so every time you have one of those mass killings, you know, the weekly, we haven't been in for a while, like at least a month there hasn't been one, that we don't read about it, because there's only five people, it's not called a mass killing, you know. You understand. So, that last guy, you know, the, he killed 58 people in the, in the, was it Las Vegas? Yeah. Las Vegas, wasn't it? This is the thing that's fascinating. The second anything like that happens, naturally the journalists, Oh, I'm being sarcastic. I'm just looking at the way we all think. The journalists, the psychologists, the police, the doctors, the first thing we do is we look into the past looking for clues, naturally, for why he did it. Now, I remember that time, you remember the Columbine kids? Remember 20 years ago? You know, that was a classic example. They're completely wacko kids, these poor kids, they did this crazy thing, killed all those children. So the first thing they do is they try to find all the things. And the first place you look is the parents. The first place you look for the causes is the parents. Well, it was infuriating. All they could find was two nice white Christian parents who didn't seem to do anything wrong. So we, it blows our mind. So then the rage that comes, because we want to blame, we've got to find something out there. We say it's the cause. What we mean is the blame. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And we're convinced that there is something outside that caused it. So what do those parents do to produce those insane children? Well, nothing, in fact, from the Buddhist perspective. These guys came with their own stuff. And this is interesting. I read recently in New York Times last year, I think, one of the mothers wrote her memoir. And the suffering this last 20 years, she buys into that view too. The guilt, the shame, the grief, the loss, the marriage broke up, people hate letters, wanted to kill her, her own guilt, her own suffering, trying to think, endlessly thinking, what did I do? What should I have done? Meaning she really did believe she was the cause of this boy of hers. Do you understand my point? It's so heavy, the burden, you know. And of course, if you have the materialist view, she is the cause. We just can't find it. So one of my friends, 
That's what they're doing with this guy in Las Vegas too. One of my friends who was in, her son was in the Justice Department at that time, somewhere in that state, Denver or somewhere, wasn't it? And she said they didn't publicise it, but they went and exhumed the brains of these two boys, determined to find the causes. That's what they've done with the Las Vegas guy. And they can't find anything. Do you understand my point? It's fascinating. You've got to just see this as what it is, you know, it's fascinating. So that means you've got to question your assumptions. But we're highly intelligent. Scientists are geniuses. But they're still gobsmacked. They can't find, you know. So it's interesting. It's just interesting, that's all. So if you're, I don't know if you Jews, do you blame God when things go wrong? I remember Italians do. <laughs> Lama Yeshi was in, in Italy in the early 80s when he's with his dear friend from Sarah, from the monastery, who's teaching Lama Yeshi's master's program, this program Lama wanted, like to re replicate the Geshe program in the monasteries, the philosophy. And this Geshe was in the hospital. So Lama was visiting and he was in the ward with all the men. And all the Italian boys were translating what the Italian men were saying about God when things go wrong, they have the rudest words. I was brought up a Catholic, you'd never dare criticise God. I mean, they say God is a pig. They say that Our Lady, the Mary, she's a whore. And they say that's mild. <laughs> and then I met an Argentinian who said they're even worse than the Italians, so I don't know. Do Jews blame God when things go wrong? No. You don't, you're too scared. We blame <laughs> oh, you do. <laughs> well, that's better than blaming God. It's just as ridiculous. Anyway, I'm joking here. But we don't like to blame God, but we love to blame mummy and daddy. And all our science leads to that. It leads, no one, I mean, the suffering is unbearable. So sure, mummies and daddies can be bad. And then it fits for us. So I remember reading at the time about the Columbine boys and no one could find the cause, so they're going crazy and who to blame, you know. At the same time, I read about some little six-year-old black kid whose mother was a junkie, whose daddy was in prison, and the little boy shot his sister. So all the boxes were ticked. Oh, that makes sense. We just closed, oh, that, that all makes sense. You know, poor, junkie, blah, you know. It's too superficial. So Buddha happens to have another view, that's all. He happens to have another view. That the consciousness is, goes before, comes into this life, programmed, not with mummies and daddies and the monkey stuff, but with our own stuff. This is not a complicated concept. You just have to hypothesize a river of mental moments. And this other view, which is expressed in this law of karma, which is very simple, really. This view that, again, Buddha did not make up. This is the point... But I've got to really stress again. This, take, this takes time to hear it, oddly enough. Because we're so used to religion being a creator who is the source of everything, right? God creates the universe. God creates me. God creates the laws, therefore. So therefore, naturally, at whatever level, God is the boss. Therefore, God, whatever level you think of it, God holds the power to punish and reward. And that level is how we think of morality. It's punishment and reward, you know? And it's the same in our mother's household. I always quote this. I mentioned in the teachings this week. You know, I asked my Jesuit priest friend, they're the intellectuals of the Catholics, what is a sin by definition? And he said it's going against the will of God, meaning that going against God's wishes is why it is wrong. The same with your mother. She says to make your bed and you don't do it. Now we know there's nothing immoral about having a messy bed. It's not innately wrong, is it? But because mummy said so is what makes it wrong. And we get that. We understand that. Many of the laws in a country aren't morally wrong. Going through a red light is not morally wrong. But we know you'll get into trouble if you do it. So there's that type of, we know this stuff. So that's the, our view totally of morality. We tend to think of it as something that someone else says you shouldn't do. And that's why we get guilt. Because our little internalised person, oh, mummy said I should not do that. And even though mummy's dead, I do it, and then up pops mummy, you know, and then, oh, I'm a naughty person. Do you hear me? Psychologically, it's ridiculous. But that's because we programmed our mind with what mummy said, daddy said, God said, the police, the judge, the teachers, some vague they out there. And we desperately, this little girl, little boy, and this is trying to live according to these rules we were told to do. And if we don't do them, we're a naughty girl. That's what guilt is. And it's neurotic. It's ridiculous. It's ego. We get this. We're familiar, aren't we, with this concept? This is part of the function of ego, Buddha says. We'll go into it in more detail. 
So that means our view of morality is what someone else says we should do. That's why if mummy doesn't see me do it, we think, oh, I got away with it. Phew. Isn't that true? This is what we think of morality. Do you generally agree? People, are you recognizing what I'm saying? It's deeply, profoundly ingrained in us. Buddha says it's, no, no, not, not yet. Keep the question. Buddha says it's a function of the root delusion called ego grasping, which we're going to go into, the sources of this stuff. Okay, my point now is this. So, it, you know, Jews, Christians, Muslims talk about God's law, isn't it? So I know in our European culture, European culture anyway, I mean, like I like to say we never know anything about India, but they're amazing, these Indians. Never, nevertheless, J European culture, Christian, Catholic, Jewish, all that business, whoever the bosses back then, Probably the Catholic Church ran the show for a while, didn't they? <laughs> Isn't it? So they held the right, they held the copyright to truth, didn't they? And that meant there's only God's law. There was no such concept back then as natural law. Listen to this, it's very fascinating. There was only God's law because all the science, all the psychology was all coming from, from, from God. And that's, I'm sure it's the same in the Jewish time at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then slowly this Galileo and these naughty people began looking at things that contradicted God and he apparently got burned at the stake. But now we have the split now, isn't it, between religion and God's law and natural law. Do you understand my point? But for the Buddha, this is my point here. What's happening? It's a car outside. I know it is, so what? Oh, it's noisy, you mean? Yeah, close the window. That's a good idea. I knew, wonder where that cold air was coming from. So anyway, listen to this point, please. This is massively important if you, if you want to understand Buddhism, okay? Please try and hear it. If you're a materialist, you wouldn't, you only say there is natural law, right? And that's what we mean by science. Do you agree? Natural law. It happens. People don't make it up. You can observe it. Now that's Buddha. And I really mean this so sincerely. It's just that he said, what he says we can observe is more subtle than we think we can in the material, scientific view. Are we communicating with that concept? He's saying it's exactly the same. And I'm not even being cliched. It is identical. Everything Buddha says is what he says he has observed with his own mind. And remember, his mind, the mind goes to more subtle levels. Therefore, you can observe things that are more subtle, that grosser level can't. That means he's observed that the mind is beginningless, the mind is not physical. He's observed countless other realms of existence. He's observed future. He's observed all this with his mind. You've got to take that as your hypothesis. You don't have to believe what he said. But you've got to open your mind to the possibility. If I were Einstein here telling you for the first time you've never heard before a thing called relativity, You'd never heard it before. You don't go, you idiot, who do you think you are? You go, well, that's interesting. I'd never heard of that before. And you either say, thanks a lot, bye-bye, and go back to your chocolate. Or you think, I'd like to look into that. You know, but we're too scared to sometimes. We just want to dismiss it as absurd nonsense, which is how we think of religion. So Buddha only posits natural law. This is a massively important point to get. I'm not asking you to believe, you know. Buddha says everything by definition is knowable. By what? Your mind, baby. So there's only natural law for the Buddha. So karma for him is a natural law. Hear this point. He didn't make it up. He's not speculating. He says he has observed this is the law that runs the universe. And the law that runs something, it doesn't mean like it's a person with a big stick. Like there's no person called botany who, who makes things grow. It's just the name we give to the law that runs gardens, is it not? Some clever people. There's always been botany, but we, some clever people over the centuries have observed it and articulated it and put special and put put it into words. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. You know, mathematics it was that genius Arab guy, wasn't it, who contradicted the silly old Romans with their X's and their V's and their L's, and he came up with naught to nine. What a genius! But he didn't make up mathematics. He came up with a concept that expressed what was already there. That's natural law. That's Buddha's view. Karma, emptiness, these are natural law. They are how the world is, Buddha says. Where from? Not from on high, from his own observation. This is the way to hear it. You might like it. You might want to look into it. You might think it's a load of rubbish. You're perfectly allowed to. You don't have to think about relativity. You don't have to think about acupuncture. You don't have to think about Buddha's view. But if you choose to, this is how you approach it, please. But just, oh yeah, I like reincarnation. Oh yeah, I like karma. No, I don't like bad karma, just good karma. <laughs> I mean, it's like being childish. 
And we really believe when it comes to religion, you're allowed to think what you like. I mean, that is beyond arrogant, beyond unintelligent. It shows we think it's superstition, you know. It's disgusting. Are we communicating here? Yeah? Good. Okay. So the mind is not physical. The mind goes to way more subtle levels. The mind is not the handiwork of mummy, daddy or a creator. The mind is not a function of the physical. And finally, delusions can be got rid of and virtues can be perfected. That's the goal of all of Buddha's methodology, all of Buddha's teachings, all Buddha's philosophy, all the psychology, all the metaphysics. That's the purpose of all of it, to end up as a Sangha. Okay, that's the essence of Buddhism, right there. What time's the tea? We have a tea break? Huh? 10.05. 10.25. It's only been an hour, so have some questions now. We're going, to go, we're going to unpack all of this for the rest of the two days, okay? That's just the summary, the presentation, the overview. So do you have any questions for clarity in terms of definitions and things? Yep. Sorry? You, you say that uh, uh, we don't understand karma, we lay people, because uh, our consciousness is not subtle enough. Okay? I didn't say that, but you're saying that, but go on. <laughs> not at the moment we don't, but you can learn it. Okay. Yeah, go on. The physical makeup, yes. yes, yes. It could be that our science is not subtle enough. Precisely, that's what Buddha would say. To understand yeah. when a person is born with such a genetic composition that creates him or her with genius or oh, I see. terrible cruelty. No, I understand. And that's and the yeah. Thing is yeah. Yes. So it seems that the parents of this boy yes. were perfect outerly. Yes, yes. I'm not, I'm not talking about the fact that they were cruel in No, I understand. I is, do understand. There is a, of course there is. A yes. Between yes. parents yes. and a child that yes. can cause terrible yes. things. I do understand your points. No, you, I really, the, the second point I completely understand. The Buddha's point in relation to the second one. Yes, there, have, there are many things that parents do at a very subtle level that can affect a child. But the Buddha's crucial point, which we have to take as our discussion here, is that whereas this, your view, the psychologist's view, is we look for the causes of the child's behaviour, we only look in the parents, etc. We never look in the child himself because we assume the child is the product of the parents. Buddha's point is saying, yes, the parents play a role, and it can be very subtle, and I'm not answering your first point yet, this is your second point, but still, the fundamental hypothesis we've got here is, those two boys didn't begin in their mother's womb. They weren't created by mummy and daddy, that they brought with them their consciousness, which is not physical, which is now discussing your first point, and it came they came with those tendencies from their having done those things before. That little girl playing Bach, the same. Mozart, the same. Mother Teresa, the same. Hitler, the same. Whatever the tendency is in the mind, there has to be the tendency there in the first place in order to be affected by the parents. So my mother, for example, is a classical musician. She saw her little Bobsy, me, and she could see that I had the tendency to be good at music. So she taught me singing, right? So naturally we say, Rabina's good at singing because her mother, it was genes. But the Buddha would simply say, my mother was good at music because she had practiced it before, past lives. I was good at music because I had practiced it before and we conveniently come together as child and daughter, child and mother, and so I'm ready and ripe to be trained. But I have to have the tendency in the first place. So it doesn't deny the role of parents, but the, our view, the modern one, gives all the role. That's what I'm trying to say. That's the first, well, it's a, you don't have to believe, I'm just telling you, the Buddha's view. Whatever, I'm, I'm, not, I mean, I'm trying to misunderstand you. But I am talking the Buddhist view here. Well, all I can do is that. <laughs> huh? I reject it to the, to the notion that psychology looks as to as, uh, children as if they come 
tabula rasa. And this is, not is it they what? No, okay. So then, but still, but okay. But good. Let's pursue. Let's pursue that. Let's pursue it. No, let let's pursue that. But but you do accept in your view, just as a philosophy. Let's just look at it. That that, that 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 there was nothing of that child's characteristics that didn't come from the parents. It has to only come from the parents, doesn't it? That okay. That's the point I'm discussing. That's all. That's all. That's all. But the first point. Again, your assumption is that maybe science has not yet found, you might be, but still, nevertheless, the Buddhist view is this crucial point that physical is physical and mental is not physical. That's all. So they're the two things, that's all. Yeah, they're the two things. Anybody, anybody else? Any other questions to, to clarify? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Number two, I have big difficulty in the field of language because it's English language translating into Hebrew mm -hmm. and maybe I suspect Sanskrit language also. Okay, go on. I know what brain is. Yeah, I understand. I think I know. This is it is it's here. So I understand. You are talking about words that I don't know how to translate that. Which, so which words? Give, be precise. Which awareness. words? Sorry, what? Awareness. Well, you just have to ask me what it mind. means. I will tell you what, what it means. What is mind? Uh, okay. What That's what we're trying. So all, it, all I can ask you to do is keep listening. Okay. Thank you. It won't come overnight. As the Dalai Lama said, it's easy to give all the words and the definitions. But if you think about it, it seems very kind of sneaky to think of something that isn't physical, to try and identify something not physical. It just sounds too weird. So all we can do is have the words first. All we can start with is the words. I mean, you know, if you're trying to learn acupuncture, as much as you will learn about a meridian, you can't see it with a microscope, you know. So it's, it's a really interesting body of knowledge. It's very subtle. But lots of people can see this benefit, and it's a, it's a system that people use, so it's not that easy. So here, all Buddha's saying is, this is what... I'm giving you the, the, the various words. So just take those on board as a theory. And then the Buddha's saying, if you take this on board and eventually you learn single-pointed concentration, this amazing technique these Indians invented before the Buddha, and you learn yourself to develop this extraordinary focus <laughs> that enables you to go to these subtler levels of mind your own self, then you will begin to experience yourself the nature of your own awareness, your own mind, your own cognitive process. That's when it becomes experiential. But all we can start with is the theories. What else? So relax with us. Enjoy the theories first. Don't squeeze our brain to try and get too much before we're ready for it. This is, do you understand? That's all. What else? Any more? Clarity? Yes. If Beethoven and Bach. If what? If Beethoven. Yeah, and Bach. Yeah. Uh, born musical. Yes, that's right, with their own tendencies. Yeah. Was musical before. Have to be, yeah. Yeah. Hitler, when he's born again in the future, yeah. crazy. Unless he, unless he, he might. unless, no, unless he, um, who said that? He might. Well, let him say what he likes. He's allowed to say that. That's okay. It, okay. It's not as, it's not as simplistic as that. We, it, if, if the, the point is, and this is where it just sounds so weird to us. If we didn't start in our mother's womb, then naturally our next question is, well, where did I begin? Because we all have that question. Well, Buddha says, sorry guys, you didn't begin. Which go, huh, excuse me, it's too weird, you know. So even get the idea that, that Bach's consciousness goes back and back and back and back, countless lives. So the second point is this, the crucial point to even, we'll go into this in more detail, this is where we talk about this law of karma, this natural law that, that all the minds and lives of sentient beings are, can be explained with, that every millisecond of everything Bach, Beethoven, Hitler, you, whatever, think and do and say, none of it goes astray. Every millisecond, it's programming your consciousness. And I'm not talking again the brain here. We're discuss it can also be that, but we're not discussing that. We're discussing your consciousness, your non-physical river of mental moments. And so you come in, so Bach came into this life with just a tiny few of his tendencies. We've got tendencies to be a, a hell being, to be an animal, to be a whale, to be a dog, to be a Hitler. We've got all those, ten all those tendencies buried deep down from past lives. But in this particular life, just a few of our tendencies ripen. Do you understand? So Hitler has, been a has had countless lives like the rest of us. 
He's been a dog, an animal, a monster, a, a saint. He's had, he's had high. For me, he's clearly been a Buddhist before. I mean, where do you think he got the swastika from? Where do you think he got the idea of Aryans from? You know, it's the Arya being, superior being that the Buddhists talk about. Just that he made a mess of it, obviously, at some point. And he comes into this life with a bunch of wacko ideas and uses it to harm people. I mean, pretty intense. But clearly he's got these billions of tendencies. So then the next point is, every single thing he did in this life, every millisecond of every thought, every action and every word, again, is programming him. So what he did in this life is the fruit of what he did in the past. And what he, what he, what he experienced in this life and did in this life is the result of the past. Just like if you play piano, it's the result of your hard work. So, but everything he does now is creating the cause for countless future and clearly lots of future suffering, but he's still got all the virtuous tendencies there. So at some point, he, like all of us, can finish that. So it's highly complex in the way Buddhism is talking about it. Are we communicating or not? Yeah. But everything is programmed. But everything is programmed. What, what would it be if it weren't programmed? I mean, Western psychology and science says it's programmed, but programmed from mummy, daddy and grandma. So we all think it's, we know it's programming. What, what choice do you want? But who says you don't? Just because you hear programming, why would you think you don't have choice? Where do you, why do you get that idea? Why do you think it contradicts, why do you think it contradicts choice? Is my question to you. Why would pro, but I mean, if you, if you, so if you, if you grow a garden, you very ch specifically put in the, you know, the veggies and the this and the flowers and the herbs and the garden comes. Well, it's the fruit of past causes. So whatever we are now is the fruit of past causes. Whatever we do now sows seeds to bring the future causes. That's the idea, which I think we understand. It's called, it's called science. So why, I'm asking you, why does that principle contradict choice? That's my question to you. Why, you have to ask that question for yourself. Why, why do you assume it contradicts choice? It's, everybody has that question. It's the commonest question we all have. It's very fascinating. Let's just leave it for a while and we'll talk more. Especially in Not especially. No. Believe me. On the free, the free will. Yeah, but that's a, I know, but it's a, Christ, it's, that's a teaching coming from God. Christians say the same. But if you analyse those words, think about those words for a second. Free. Free? What does it mean, free? Will. So the Buddhist answer would be this, and I think we have... Okay, I'll, I'll say one thing, and I think you'll all agree with this. Just, again, think. Anger's a te let's say anger is a tendency in somebody's mind. Let's say playing piano is a tendency in somebody's mind. Now, if you have such a strong tendency, let's say Shuki is good at playing Bach, and he's perfected it, and he just... So you can almost say he's practised so much piano that he has no choice but to play the notes right. He doesn't even have to, he doesn't say, will I cho choose middle C or D? He just spontaneously plays it because he's perfected it. Can you accept that? So what do you mean by free will? It's a joke to say that. He's programmed himself with music. Now he just plays spontaneously. It's the same with anger. If, he's, if you've got such anger, you can almost argue you can't access your patience. You just respond So that's really, in a sense, of course we all have the potential to choose. But that's what Buddha would say. Everybody has the chance. There's nothing permanent, nothing set in stone. But when you practice something very strongly, it's like you've got no choice. And I think that's very realistic. So we tend to think that free will... Okay, if you, we've all got tendencies, right? We get jealous easily, we might get attached easily, we might get angry easily, we might get depressed easily. We all agree? The last time you got depressed, did you say, well, will I get depressed today or not? Oh, no, I don't think I'll get depressed. I don't think it was like that, was it? Suddenly you find, oh, my God, I'm depressed. Suddenly you find, you don't say, will I shout at my husband today? Oh, no, forget it. You're just reeling from these shocking words that came out your mouth again. Oh, my God, what happened, you know? So choice is not that easy. But if we've got intelligence, we can think about it. That's the saving grace. And then you can begin, okay, my habits, my old habit is to get angry, but I, let's decide to try and find it and catch it. And that's why you need single point of concentration, so you can step back and observe your crazy mind and then begin to exercise intelligence. So choice is really intelligence. You could argue that choice is intelligence. Do you get what I mean by that? Be able to observe objectively. 
And then even though you're locked in your anger at the moment, you can still hear it and see it and make a decision. Okay, let's attempt to change it slowly. That I think is more like intelligence. So of course we've got, you know, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's our saving grace. That's what we need desperately. But if we're very ignorant and very stubborn and very angry and you just blame everybody else, well, you could almost say you've got no choice. You're just stuck, you know, you're paralyzed. And the other point is this also, Buddhists would say, let's say you see a homeless person, you know, the typical one, people might say, arrogant, oh, they, everyone's got free will. Look at these lazy people. Why don't they get a job? Well, the Buddhist you would be one of the main causes of your being poor is your lack of generosity from the past. No matter how hard you try to get a job, you just can't. So you might want to get a job as much as you like, but the conditions aren't there that enable you to get a job. That's pretty reasonable. You might, you know, the conditions aren't there. So it's more simple than merely saying you've got the freedom to choose. If we analyse our lives, it's not that simple. It's more complex. You understand what I'm saying? So? Yeah. So what else? Well, I just better carry on and talk a bit longer. 10.40. You want a tea break? Yeah. Now? Enough time now or you want a bit longer? Right now. Okay, have a tea break. Right now.